Hi, it's Steve Hargadon, and I'm coming to you live from the offices of Edmodo in San Mateo, California, where we had yesterday our first Global Leadership Summit. This is the kickoff keynote for Global Leadership Day. We have Fernando Reimers and Connie Chung here. Welcome to both of you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. I'm going to quickly go through some material here. We want to thank our sponsors and supporters for this event. This is a week-long set of events. The first two days, we're doing some formal activities. The rest of the week, people have self-scheduled uh, activities and events for you to participate in. Do go to globaledleadership.com, and you can see the full schedule, schedule there. Thanks, thanks so much to VIF, Google, Wonderment, Edmodo, Tez, and the rest of this terrific gang for supporting this event. This is a chance for those of you who are participating live to indicate where you are located in the world. So look to the left of the map. You should see a set of icons. You're looking for the star icon. You can click on it twice and then click on the map. Feel free to put a shout out in the chat as well, indicating where you are, the time, the temperature. And because we only have a half hour, I'm going to move us forward. But please feel free to continue to put notes in the chat. Thank you, Fernando. Steve. I think I'm going to turn it over to you first. Go ahead, and then uh, I'll help you as we get toward the end. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, and I first want to thank you and Lucy for providing us this opportunity to speak with your audience. I think this event you're organizing online is such a beautiful example of the power of modern telecommunication uh, technologies to allow people to communicate uh, across time and uh, mostly across space. So this is terrific. We're going to spend a bit of time sharing with uh, the 22 or so of you who are in the main room today, and maybe those of you who can watch this later, some work we're doing at Harvard to decode the competencies of 21st century education. Uh, with me is my colleague, Dr. Connie Chung. She's going to speak in a moment. She's the research director of the Global Education Innovation Initiative. And we have just co-edited a book, which is available to all of you uh, via Harvard Education Publishing Publisher or any of the online retailers. And the name of that book is Teaching and Learning for the 21st Century. We have a special conference code for those of you participating at this conference. You can obtain that book at discount. And I think, uh, Steve, you're going to help us place that code in um, online. So the Global Education Innovation Initiative is um, an effort, a cross-national effort, designed to advance the improvement of educational, education, educational opportunity so that it is more relevant to empower young people to address the challenges of the 21st century. And it's, the initiative has essentially three main components. One component is research. And very systematically, we are producing a series of studies which will be published uh, just like this first book has been to share that work. And so what this book does, uh, Connie's going to talk in, in a moment about the key themes of this book. We are now working on a second book looking at the characteristics of programs to prepare teachers that are highly effective in helping them enact the pedagogies that support 21st century learning. We're also doing a book looking at a number of exemplary 21st century programs around the world in the countries in which the initiative is currently active, which include China, India, Singapore, Colombia, Chile, Mexico, and the United States. Um, the second component of the initiative, it consists of participating in platforms that other individuals and groups have built, such as uh, this particular platform, this conference that uh, brings us together today, as well as creating our own platforms. Um, on Monday, May 9th, we're going to have a large convening, public convening at Harvard University from 4 to 6, to which you're all invited, at which we will be presenting and discussing uh, our book with a panel of key policymakers and education leaders in Massachusetts. Um, we will be hosting with the government of China a summit, a U.S.-China summit on the, the future of education and 21st century education in June of this year. And so we are both building our own platforms, and in, by these I don't mean a technological platform, but a concept that can bring together 
uh, individuals interested in advancing education so that it, that it most effectively supports the development of the competencies that matter. And the final component of the initiative is essentially finding opportunities to bring to scale this DNA of 21st century education, which we're busy in the process of decoding. And so at the moment, we're developing a range of prototypes. We're working with the National Institute of Education in Singapore in a program to prepare system level leaders, ministries of education and others, which will be live uh, this um, summer. We're going to bring together 60 ministries of education around the world for uh, a, a very interactive program to develop their leadership capacities to make education systems more relevant. We're working with the government of uh, New Delhi and with our partners in India developing a similar program aimed at school uh, leaders and district level leaders. And we'll be working with others developing prototypes that can help us bring to scale some of this DNA of 21st century education in ways that can support practitioners at different levels of the education ecosystem so that they can align education systems with the challenges of our time. So let me conclude basically um, connecting our initiative with the current biggest global challenges that humanity faces, uh, which I think are uh, to some extent addressed in the recently approved sustainable development goals by the UN and by governments around the world. Those 17 goals reflect an aspirational vision of what would it take to build a world that is sustainable, where people can live in peace with one another, when we can uh, bring out of the most abject forms of poverty and exclusion the very large numbers of people who live in those conditions today. And the question of achieving those goals is fundamentally at the core, a question of building new human capacities, both knowledge, skills, dispositions, uh, and, and the efficacy to individually and collectively create the conditions in the world that makes it possible to bring people out of poverty, to reduce inequality, to promote religious tolerance and acceptance across all lines of differences, to engage with the environment in, in ways that are sustainable over the long haul. And, uh, and, uh, and developing those capacities is fundamentally what education systems can do. We think that leading education systems is something that can be approached from three perspectives. One of them is make sure that uh, the trains run on track, that people do what they're supposed to. The second way dominant in most approaches to reform around the world is define a few goals, measure performance of those systems on those goals, and then basically hold individuals and institutions accountable as a way to create incentives for people to incrementally improve their performance in those goals. This is uh, very much the theory of action of what in the United States is called standards-based reform. But there's a third and very important approach to improvement, which consists of stepping outside the system and looking outside schools, looking at the world, and asking the question of what should we be doing differently, and, and um, how do we serve needs that have not been adequately served. And what we're trying to do in the Global Edu Education Innovation Initiative is to support educators, practitioners, who uh, are already working along those lines in a way to help them have access to a community and to knowledge that would make them more effective. So maybe I'd like to stop here and ask my colleague Connie Chung to talk a little bit about the core themes and findings of our first book. Thank you so much, Fernando. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about um, the book and the content of the book. We based our research on reviewing lots of documents around what scholars and practitioners and um, even governments and businesses were saying were important competencies for students to learn in the 21st century. Um, and of those documents, we found um, the most helpful a research brief um, that was put out by the National Research Council in 2012 by Professors Hilton and Pellegrino. And in that, they summarized the most recent psychological literature around what people were saying um, that students needed for the 21st century. And these competencies basically fell into three different buckets. Interpersonal competencies, which are um, competencies that help you get along with others, resolve conflict, uh, work on teams, collaborate well. 
um, intrapersonal competencies, which are about um, self-management, such as um, grit or perseverance or self-management. Um, and then, of course, the cognitive competencies, which are about knowledge and even creativity and innovation, um, fell under that category. So in the book, what we did with our partners from five other countries um, was to take that uh, basically three large bucketed uh, taxonomy and looked at the national curriculum frameworks in those countries. So for example, for the US, uh, because we don't really have a national curriculum framework, we looked at the common core uh, standards for math and literacy. And then uh, we actually chose Massachusetts to focus on Massachusetts because our particular country's context is that um, the state systems have a lot more power um, and say over what gets taught than say our federal government um, because of our constitution. So um, we took the Common Core standards and then we took the history standards, the social studies standards, and the, um, the science standards for Massachusetts. And we basically um, coded I think it came out to be about a thousand different um, standards or, or um, phrases in, in, um, in the curriculum frameworks and tried to see um, whether there were any trends in terms of um, what was getting taught or what was getting emphasized. And so um, what we found for the United States was that um, of the thousand pieces that we coded, over 900 um, were in the cognitive category, and then um, very few in the interpersonal, the group, um, the social competencies, and then even fewer in the self-management interpersonal competencies, um, which I guess might not surprise most of us, but I think I was surprised by um, the degree to which there was such an overemphasis on, um, on cognitive competencies. And we did that for the other countries as well, to varying degrees um, and, in, and in different ways. But I think overall, um, one of the big conclusions of the book is that we actually found that most most countries had made an effort to expand the goals, um, that learning goals. Um, they had heard from business leaders in their own countries. They had heard from um, places like UNESCO um, uh, or even you know large, larger um, world or global organizations that kept on saying you know we need to expand what we teach in our classroom. So most of them did. That's the one big takeaway. But then because of different incentives um, and that varies by country. Um, most of the, the standards still remain mostly focused on cognitive, so that's one big finding. We also did some, um, we also did some uh, interviewing of stakeholders, uh, so educational stakeholders in each country about how these um, competencies came to be that way, how these curriculum frameworks came to be that way, how did these policies came to come to be that way. And again, I think that's a really interesting part of our book um, that I don't think many, very many people focus on in terms of just figuring out how is a sausage made in terms of what gets prioritized and why. So the quick sketch from the U.S. chapter. Um, I noticed at the beginning when Steve was asking, you know, who's participating in the conference, most of the people are from the U.S. Um, for the U.S., we found, or at least for the Massachusetts, we found that in 2008, um, our Secretary of Education had actually convened a task force um, on 21st century learning. And the task force composed of, you know, different stakeholders, not just from education, but from community leaders and um, business people, had come up with very sensible recommendations around, you know, find, identifying pilot schools who are doing this well. Um, figuring out ways to align teacher preparation programs and standards um, with the needs of the 21st century, et cetera, et cetera. But we, when we interviewed them in 2013, or to the, actually 2014, a couple of years ago, um, many of those people on the task force had kind of forgotten that they had been on that task force, much less what had been on the task force. So we asked, how did that happen? Um, and the short answer is that the federal government came in with Race to the Top, which gave you know, incredibly good support um, to um, improving standards. But it didn't necessarily focus on 21st century uh, competencies. And so that kind of fell. Um, there were other reasons, but that was one of the major reasons why um, when the state government is relatively short uh, staffed and this large grant comes in the, from the federal government, all the resources went to trying to procure that grant rather than trying to pursue what they had started with this task force. So it fell to the wayside. Um, so again, a, a takeaway is that while the, um, the standards have expanded and the learning goals have expanded in all the countries, the implementation um, of these learning goals in the actual classrooms and the way that they're assessed, they come relatively fall short um, of, the of the grander um, purposes and, and goals that are outlined in these, in these curriculum frameworks. So that would be takeaway number two. Um, and then the third um, kind of discussion would be that the, um, 
the ways in which the, the countries are, um, I would say, administratively configured actually impacts quite a bit. So we took a look at, um, we have in our book, uh, Chile, China, Mexico, India, Singapore, and the U.S. In Singapore, as an example, um, that the, the link that Fernando just uh, put up, um, we took a bunch of about 15 um, educational stakeholders and leaders from Massachusetts to Singapore for a week-long tour um, in October, last October. And um, that book outlines some of the things that they had found. And one of the takeaways is that Systematically, Singapore is much more aligned in the ways that they um, configure their, their prep preparation of teachers, the practice in their classroom, and also the policy. Um, and so if the, if they, when they expand the goals of education as they did in trying to figure out how to, what to teach their students in the 21st century, they also changed their practice in the classroom and they also changed the preparation of their teachers. So there's quite a bit of alignment. In contrast to that, in many of the other countries where much of it is decentralized, like ours is in the United States, um, the goals might have changed, but the um, preparation of teachers and the actual practice in the classroom tends to lag behind as a whole um, at a, at a systems level. So of course, there, there are lots of teachers who are doing incredibly good work, um, including around global citizenship education all over the United States. But systematically speaking, um, that is not actually happening. We're not systematically supporting the efforts of those who are doing that either through our policy or through our preparation or even in the way that we um, monitor the practice. So that would be the third takeaway, that there's kind of a need to pay attention to not just what is getting taught, but how it's getting taught. So as Fernanda mentioned, um, that was a way in which we were able to then say for the next book, we would really like next year look, take a look at um, teacher capacity building in different countries and then see who is doing this well in terms of changing teacher preparation practices so that we have more um, teachers in the classroom who are better prepared um, to teach these broader goals in education. So I'll stop there and then we can maybe go into questions or friends. No, I think that was excellent. Thank you, Connie. Um, I, I love uh, Lucy's question on uh, what it is that um, you know, how, how do I make sure educators think about the Sustainable Development Goals? And I shared a short article on that subject for all of you to see. Yeah. And the, the book on Singapore is available right now as of today on the Lulucom platform. So no special discount for that one, but it's a very affordable book. Are you seeing the question from Barbara? What has the U.S. been doing or intending to do as far as getting a T's and S's global citizens in terms of standards? Oh, a lot. Yeah. Uh, you know that the Department of Education, the Federal Department of Education, has developed a strategy to, um, that basically promotes international education and global education um, across states. So that's one of the things that we have done. We have, of course, a lot of variation in our country, as you would expect, because most action takes place at the state level and even below that level. So to give you an example, Ohio is a state that very early on, about eight years ago, developed an overarching state framework to advance global education. And more recently, um, as a result of the leadership of the World Affairs Council and the Chambers of Commerce there, they uh, have built a collaborative of district leaders and principals to advance global education in their public schools. There are similar initiatives happening around the US. So I think the US, in many ways, is a very big laboratory in the practice of global education. And increasingly, people are finding ways to infuse in the existing standards opportunity to develop global ed. So Paul has raised his hand. Paul has given you the microphone. I'm sorry. If you want to ask a question, Paul, you can turn your microphone on by clicking the talk button, or you can put your question in the chat. Fernando and Connie, I'm, I'm interested. Is there an inherent conflict between uh, education and government policy, meaning uh, at some de to some degree education is about questioning and independent thinking? And, and does does that ever come in conflict with sort of larger governmental designs? Connie, why don't you take a crack and then I'll be happy to chime in. I think there's multiple purposes. So this is talking about civic education, I think, is kind of the, the broader, um, broader area. And I think there are different, so um, if you're familiar with Kahn and Westheimer's article on different ways of, of being a citizen, there's at least three different ways from what I remember from their article. Um, I can try to dig that up and 
after I finish talking and, and send that link to you, it's incredibly valuable. They talk about um, citizens who are you know, obedient to the law and just keep law and order. That's one, one way of being a citizen, which is, does not actually conflict with what you're, I think, suggesting. The second one is um, citizen, people who actually help and try to produce some good in the community. I think that's the second level. And the third one is people who are trying to change things in, 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 as, as they exist. So I think that may be most closely aligned to what you're asking, Paul, although you might be actually, from what, I, from what I'm hearing behind your question, even pushing the envelope a little bit more. So I don't know that I can give a definitive answer to that, but I do think governments have a role to play in to make sure that, that students have an exposure to at least all three. Um, Maybe not even governments, maybe individual teachers have, if they are caring about the kind of democratic societies that we live in and want to make sure that we have critical thinkers who are not just going by whatever is being, um, whatever is being promoted but are able to question and not only just question but also collaborate um, and actually effectively make change. Um, I, it's, it's, a, it's a huge question. So I'm, I'm having a little bit of trouble getting my, getting, um, a straightforward answer, but I think there's a lot of room for uh, teachers to to help students in that process. If I could add, already, the way I understand your question, Steve, is is there a tension between government intervention in education and the promotion of independent critical thinking on the part of citizens? And I, of course, understand this question coming uh, from an American context where our tradition is so grassroots, is so local, our governance of education is so local, and we so value independent thinking. However, the very creation of public education as an intervention that calls for government intervention is about achieving uh, the goals of serving uh, not just some individuals, but all individuals, right, of, of creating opportunity for all. And I think that Comparatively speaking, the U.S. is a latecomer to having, for example, the federal government play a role in supporting education, but I do think that those efforts have been very beneficial in terms of um, contributing to level the playing field through a number of interventions, financial supports, um, assistance of some sorts, and most importantly, setting standards and creating systems of accountability and making visible uh, inequalities which were prior to 1968 when the Coleman report was conducted were invisible. They existed, but we didn't talk about them because we didn't have systematic, systematic information to document that zip code was for many children um, synonymous with opportunity to learn, to develop skills. So I do think there is absolutely a role for government. I think that uh, having a federal government play a role in curriculum is absolutely in line with what some of the most uh, advanced nations in terms of advancing equity do. Uh, if you look at the countries in our initiative, um, the countries that we're studying, the country where the federal government plays the least role is the United States. Um, having said that, I think the, the challenge, as Connie mentioned, is to achieve a fine balancing act between allowing federal intervention, top-down intervention, to do what it's best at doing without limiting the creativity, the innovation, the, the talent that comes from grassroots involvement, local involvement, community involvement, as well as other forms of, invo of involvement in civil society. And, um, and so that's why in the Global Education Innovation Initiative, for example, as we look around the world at programs that are trying to create the conditions in schools to provide a balanced education for students, we are interested in government-led initiatives, as in the case of China, for example, government-supported programs of teacher professional development, but also at initiatives that are the result of public-private partnerships, as in the case of the United States, we are studying a phenomenal program, Expeditionary Learning of Teacher Professional Development, that is the result of initiatives of a group of teachers, or a group of citizens, I guess, outside government but who are able to carry out their work as a result of building very productive partnerships with districts, with uh, foundations, with governments, and, uh, and increasingly with state governments. So I think that there is a, an important yin and yang that needs to be achieved in terms of equipping all students with the capacities to participate as citizens, and governments very much have a role to play. Thanks for that answer. If you have a question for Fernando or Connie, you can put it in the chat. We probably have time for one or two more questions. If I've missed the question, please point it out for me. Uh, what, what role have foundations played across these different countries, non-governmental organizations? 
Connie, you want to take that? I don't think we actually looked at in our study what role foundations have played. Um, so I don't know that I can I can answer that question. Do you have a reason for asking that question? Could I ask you to kind of elaborate more on why? I think there was one that? country in the notes that I read where the non-governmental organizations were sort of a significant oh, right. part of the... Right. Okay. Yeah, so not necessarily foundations, but these are uh, social entrepreneurs or NGOs, um, like in our country, let's say, Facing History Ourselves or Asia Society. So people who have decided as a nonprofit to take on teaching some of these skills, especially in places like China, we're finding, where the, um, the curriculum tends to focus still on um, exam-based um, learning because that determines uh, their future uh, in terms of college entrance and what, what happens to them afterwards. We found quite a huge uh, list of um, organizations that we're studying right now in China who have bubbled up because the demand is there from the parents and the community members to have students learn more um, interpersonal and leadership kind of skills and creativity and innovation and entrepreneurship. And so lots of social entre entrepreneurs and um, NGOs have taken up the call. Same with India um, for different reasons, not so much because they, would, they have an exam-based system, but because the quality of their education system is relatively low, a lot of educational leaders have taken it upon themselves to establish NGOs that are um, focused more on, let's say, global citizen citizenship or creativity um, or, or resolving conflict or social emotional skills to, to fill up that space to meet that demand. So that, yeah, we have found that kind of almost as a, a side effect of our research. We weren't necessarily looking for it, but as we were studying what was happening in schools, we couldn't help but notice a lot of the innovation is happening actually outside of schools. So we probably have time for this final question from Barbara. What collaboration with businesses does government and policy do put government and policymakers have to afford and ensure equitable distribution of technology outside of school, including access to the web? I, I have not studied that question to provide an informed um, answer, but my own engagement in the work of policy and practice tell me that there are very many productive opportunities that uh, business government collaborations can result in. And the U.S. is a good example of that, but there are similar examples in, in other places. My own view when it comes to achieving the goal of providing every student the opportunity to gain the competencies that would give them autonomy and independence and, and the capacity to be self-authoring is that the task is too big for any single actor to achieve alone and that we need all efforts. So I'm rather uh, agnostic. I don't believe that any single institution has the monopoly of the, of the power to deliver on that goal. And I think that what we need to build are uh, the opportunities for uh, people from all sectors, business and government, to come together um, in service of helping individuals develop the capacities to uh, to basically improve themselves and improve the communities in which they live. Yeah. I think accountability is really important, not in terms of testing, but in terms of just transparency so that it actually is equitable and people do have equitable um, access, but and also a, an equal distribution of quality um, as well when, when different partners um, kind of decide to collaborate together. So the transparency part, I think, is really important, and so is community participation, um, just to make sure that people have voice and they're heard um, in whatever gets decided. Okay, thanks to both of you. The book is Teaching and Learning for the 21st Century, Fernando Reimers and Connie Chung. Thanks for kicking off this event today. We really appreciate you taking the time to do so. The book looks fascinating. I've put the link for the book with a discount in the chat again. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much, thank Steve, for a so wonderful moderation. And thank you to you and Lucy for providing this opportunity for public dialogue on global education and leadership. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you both. Don't miss the rest of the events at globalleadership.com and, of course, the giant Global Education Conference, which we hold each November at globaleducationconference.com. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Hope you'll join us for the rest of some of the rest of the sessions. Bye now.